Hi, David here, and we are at the Art of the Flight Jacket at the Historical Flight Foundation. And the Historical Aviation Guild is putting on a huge display. Because we marshal airplanes and stuff like that, so. Area Brian Heim. <laughs> Chris Miller. Rob Hoffman. Say hi to my YouTube gang. Hello. Working against us, but we'll just wait till the afternoon and see how it goes. Uh, in the coming week, we have several events of, uh, of note. On tomorrow through Tuesday, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum is having their mutual concerns conference centered at the Museum of Flight at Boeing Field. These are the museum administrators, leaders, directors from many of the leading aviation museums in the country and indeed in the world. The um, Tuesday, uh, three of us, two from Payne Field, Adrian Hunt and myself, and Greg Anders from uh, Heritage Flight Museum in Bellingham, will speak on what it's like to try to run a museum with airplanes that fly. So, uh, to whatever great spirit you subscribe, please, uh, please offer an entreaty on our behalf on Tuesday morning at about 10. Because we'll be trying to explain to people who dust airplanes that haven't flown for 50 years about what we do here. And it's a daunting task. The um, next day we will entertain those folks. They will actually come to Payne Field and make the rounds uh, of the attractions here and try to get a better idea of what it's like, particularly at Flying Heritage Collection in here, what it's like to operate airplanes. And then later that day, we have uh, 40 school principals and district administrators come here to launch our STEM program. We're going to start using the facility for science and math education in the middle and high schools, uh, both public and private starting first in our own neighborhood, but also uh, in the greater uh, Seattle area. So uh, Wednesday will be a full day. And then next Saturday, our, our, our good friend, can you be the best friend of the museum? Sure. Absolutely. Mike Lavelle will be teaching the uh, B-17 ground school in anticipation of aluminum overcasts arrival on a sunny day, uh, May 22nd. And she'll be here for two days, uh, offering rides on a historic flight. So enough about us. Come to any and all if you can. The uh, guest today, our guest is, uh, Jerry's been here before. Jerry uh, came into contact with uh, me, at least, through uh, Carter Peters of our pilots and another good friend. And he said, you really ought to get in touch with Jerry and all her wonderful work. It turns out that this lady has made a career and uh, from all appearances, a viable one, uh, studying nose art on old airplanes. And then taking the nose art that is historically accurate and uh, projecting it onto some of the recent restorations. So when a, a project is undertaken, you want to have somebody like Jerry in mind for the finishing touches before you uh, introduce the airplane. Then uh, that business has uh, morphed or evolved or grown into apparel. Uh, not only replicating those art, but in the case of our topic today, similar art that finds its way to the leather flight jacket. And like so many things in life, you can study it at one, two, or three levels. And she's definitely gotten to the third level, like you'll see today. Uh, very glad you could come. Very glad Jerry could come. She'll also be attending mutual concerns with us at, uh, for uh, the period between now and Tuesday. And it was just serendipitous that we could persuade her to come here on her way to mutual concerns. Because after all those static 
display people have three days with her. She may not be the same person. <laughs> <laughs> so please welcome our good friend Jerry, and after she has concluded her uh, presentation, we'll have a lovely fashion show. Well, I have to say, if I am at level three when it comes to knowledge of flight jackets, the people of the historic aviation guild are probably at level nine. So I, I freely accept any advice from my experts standing nearby. I, I had expected I might be a t a talking to a crowd of dentists and then it would be, psst, hey, I'm in. But uh, that's obviously not the case and I should have expected that with John around. So, um, we're going to try this is fabulous new invention, which is the remote on this presentation. See if we work it here. This is one of my favorite songs, and I always start presentations with rum and coke. It's not a great song to start a presentation with. Rum and coke, cola. Okay. All right. What I want to start with is the admission that the flight jacket is probably recognized as the aviator's uniform. And maybe you may not agree with me, but if you flip any book on a, a major aviation figure, if you uh, go on the internet and find pictures of any uh, well-known, respected celebrity aviation individual, chances are, nine times out of ten, you're going to find them in a flight jacket. It is the uh, recognized symbol of the aviator, if, from what I have seen so far, it's my personal opinion. Uh, I have an example shown up here. It's just one of the books we have in our aviation library, a, a book on, one of the many books on Eddie Rickenbacker, the famous uh, World War I, and following uh, aviation um, uh, giant started Eastern Airlines. And you can see that, uh, that very magnificent posy sitting in there with that great leather overcoat in which he was um, painted in several times in this particular jacket. It, it was part of his uniform, was this and other jackets like it. Uh, let's take in somebody else. We had Jackie Cochran. Uh, most of you in here probably are very familiar with Jackie. Um, she was born a socialite in Pasadena, turn of the century. Uh, came from a very well-to-do family, but she wanted nothing to do with business. She wanted to fly. And uh, this was one of the photos she had taken of herself, and it was one of her favorites. Uh, she has that very rakish air about her. She's got her cigarette, her goggles, and her flight jacket on. And uh, she admitted in some uh, papers that this was how she preferred to be remembered, was in her flight jacket. Another famous aviator, I'm sure you can pick him out in the crowd there. You see Lindbergh there in the, with the leather jacket on. He was very, uh, from what I, from the readings I've done, he was a very business-like, very professional individual, very self-contained, very collected. And you can see he's got a business suit on underneath that flight jacket, or leather jacket there. And, um, and the mayor over there, this is the mayor of Chicago in 1924, I think, something like that, you know, doesn't look nearly as well dressed as Lindbergh does, I think. Amelia Earhart, she uh, preferred linens. You can see her in uh, many photographs, and she's got lovely trousers and linen song. But when she went up in the air, she normally always had this uh, flight stone with button collars, button down. It was also part of her uniform. In the military leader world, this, this, there was no exception there as, as well. Uh, Jimmy Doolittle, uh, as you can see, is where uh, him and the uh, volunteer raiders there behind him are all wearing uh, the standard A2 of the day with their various squadron patches on um, as part of a publicity shoot. And now here's MacArthur, right? He, uh, well, he was from the infantry. And he uh, commanded the uh, uh, Air Corps units, uh, but he was from the Army himself. But you wouldn't see him uh, in a publicity uh, photo without that flight suit, uh, without that flight jacket very often. And, and you guys out there, you know, please uh, raise your hand and say, no, that's not the way it was. I'm happy to learn more here. Test pilots. Test pilots, you know, uh, epitomize our view of the rakish, daring, bold, uh, take all risks pilots uh, and their carefree uh, view towards flying. Chuck Yeager was a very serious pilot, and of course, uh, holds a, a ton of records. And for this publicity shoot here, who's uh, breaking the sound barrier, you can see he's got his trusty Navy flight jacket on with his name strip there. 
So the point is, I, as you can see, that uh, the jacket, the leather flight jacket is ubiquitous when you talk about aviators and their uniforms. This is a group of astronauts that are uh, training for the first Mercury program in the 60s. They've got their modern flight suits on and their survival vests and helmets, etc. But you still have a guy over there on the left hand side with his Navy, uh, leather Navy flight suit on. Or, excuse me, flight jacket. Now, in the movies, the movies, I think, even perpetuated uh, the um, long standing tradition of wearing a flight jacket. And even when it wasn't necessary in movies, the pilots had to have their leather flight jackets on. John Wayne here in Flying Tigers uh, certainly is no exception to that rule. He's got a stunning 82 on and a stunning nurse on. <laughs> now, Steve McQueen, I think, uh, absolutely fills out a flight jacket really well. And later, uh, later on, I mean, actually in the past, uh, in the 80s, he created almost a single-handedly an industry by himself with his flight jackets uh, in Japan, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, there he is, the war lover, and uh, significant scenes in the movie are, are him and his flight jacket, as well as uh, uh, Bob Wagner, his co-star, uh, with his shirtling on there. Okay, now, admit it, you guys, what guy in this room has not at one point fantasize about being Tom Cruise in this movie. <laughs> Admit it. So Top Gun, right, one of the uh, highest grossing aviation films of all time when it came out in the 80s. And I understand also that uh, the jacket we've been seeing the most of in terms of flight jackets is the A2. And we've got many great examples here. Um, and the A2 generally has outsold uh, the G1, the Navy version of the flight jacket, from about, about, in about a 4 to 1 ratio. After this movie came out, it came out to be dead even. There were selling just as many G1s as they were A2 jackets, and he made it look pretty good. <laughs> All right, there's no, uh, there's no reason why a president can't wear a flight jacket, right? He has that, right? Now, George W. here actually was an air, uh, was in the reserves in the Air Force, I understand, although he is wearing a Navy uh, flight jacket there, uh, so he can be forgiven for that. Um, Obama now, I don't. I don't know his military record, if he has one or not, but um, when he is in front of his troops in the ceremonial capacity, he's given a flight suit, a flight jacket to wear. And I do apologize if I say flight suit versus flight jacket. To the purest in the room, I do apologize. Um, you, you know, so um, it's the uniform and you're supposed to have it, right? When you're talking to those armed forces. Let's see why. Now, the reason why jackets, I believe, um, are just a ubiquitous part of the aviator's uniform is that they were required. They were survival in, uh, in the early days. Um, I see a beautiful example of a nice heavy uh, jacket there on the end that the Historic Aviation Guild has given us there in the very end. Uh, you need these big heavy jackets because you were in really cold environments. Here's the uh, uh, Kitty Hawk here where they're doing some tests uh, with the Wright Flyer. And you see the guys are bumping up as they're taking their pictures. There's a 30 knot wind here. Um, and the guy up there at Warhol or Wilbur, whoever's flying, that's, that's a pretty cold environment. And as you get higher, as, as we all know, it gets even colder. These jackets were absolutely essential to, to keep warm. Now, I do apologize. I can't remember the name. This is an Italian Moncou. And I, his name is Edward Ringen or something. Somebody in here might know. But um, you can see everyone up around him is bundled up. This is in 1904 or, yeah, 1904, and everybody's bundled up, and he's uh, right there on the top, but there's no uh, break at all in the wind that he's going to get, so it must have been pretty cold all the time. Now, this reproduction, reproduction Valerio, uh, which this gentleman is just about to get into, <laughs> you can see he's preparing for the flight aptly, he's uh, putting on his coat. The next picture, which it came clearer, I think is a little bit more appropriate, there's hands up, and woohoo, now I'm looking my hands. Great, great shot. And uh, the, the Fokker here also exemplifies the conditions under which these very early pilots flew in. Uh, now, ignore the microphone coming out of his, uh, his uh, flight helmet there, but it indicates again that they're in the wind and it, it can be very, very uh, cold in the elements there. And so the uh, outfits that we saw that the aviators wore emphasized protection. Of course, there you know other mishaps can happen too, and they had no protection other than what they put over them. So here's some ads that I pulled um, that uh, show you what you know what they were trying to sell was you know uh, 
protection from head to foot. I love the Burberry ad there. Of course, that company is still in existence today. Um, where they say you have to, it's, it's form, function, and you look darn good in that, in that jacket. On the left here, the Spalding Aviation Company, um, you can see you can buy this overcoat for $50, but it also required a liner on the inside. You can see that uh, it comes with a lightweight um, jacket liner with fleece in it. Uh, um, the Army, Army Air Force uh, pretty much through World War II before they went to cloth. And now we're starting to see stuff happening in terms of art on flight jackets. Now this young man with the P-38 behind him, has got a squadron patch on. You can see on his left chest there. It looks like it is the 94th Aero Squadron, the Hat and Ring patch. Now, what is a squadron patch all about? I mean, what, why do that? Well, it all goes back to the heraldry and identification of these military units. Back in the Crusades, if I show you this picture here, knights, you know, were covered head to foot in metal, riding a big charger, and they were pretty much looked identical to each other, and they began to cover themselves in, in identifying material of a certain color as to be more plainly identified on the battlefield and for other purposes. And this very quickly evolved into having a set of colors for a family or an organization. I love this particular picture because, I mean, you can see that, that you know, different organizations, it's very clear whose side's on what side because of the colors they're wearing. You didn't have to know the individual, you just had to know what, what banner he was flying under. And so, uh, as I mentioned, you saw on, on that squadron patch, one of the first American uh, aviation uh, squadron insignias that was developed was the 94th Aero Squadron. Is that right? 94th? Thank you. And <laughs> I like that particular insignia because it had, to, it had to do with the United States finally getting into the war and throwing their hat into the ring. So there's a lot of great symbology in that particular patch. That happens to be Eddie Rickenbacker standing right next to it there. That was his airplane that he got several kills in. So we are starting to see um, things actually being painted on the jackets for, for a really good reason for identification. Now, I found this particular, particular picture, and it might even be in this great book. If you don't have book, this book and you'd like to learn more about art on flight jackets, uh, John McGuire is one of the, uh, probably most, one of the most respected uh, experts on flight jacket artwork, and one of his books is right here, I see. But anyway, this is a group of uh, marine trainers, 1930. They're wearing their squadron insignia, you can see on their backs, as artwork, which, uh, which is happening quite frequently uh, during World War II as well. Here's just a number of patches, and I see some just stunning patches up here on the on the table. So if you have specific questions, boy, these guys are the ones to ask. But from what I understand, the War Department had said that squadron, being a distinctive insignia for a unit, had to be built by the unit. It was not government issue, therefore the government wasn't going to pay for it, so they had to go get it themselves. And they could purchase it using their funds through a government uh, agency. Uh, but generally, and especially in combat situations, they went out to wherever they were and had their patches made. So what I like about this particular slide is you can see all the different varieties that you would find some artwork or a squadron on. You see some of uh, the CBI patches there on the right are made out of piece leather, different pieces of leather that are sewn together with different, of different colors. You have patches that are embroidered. Uh, you had patches that were just hand painted directly to the leather, like you see jigs on the, on the lower right there. Um, and so the variety of patches is what I think would be really fascinating if you were a patch collector, because where the patch was made is really almost as important as what, what was on the patch. So this is a, a lot of what the artwork was on flight jackets in World War II. Mm -hmm. Now, to talk about other kinds of art on, jack on jackets, you really do have to say a few words about nose art, another one of my favorite topics. A lot of the artwork that you saw in World War II, and World War II definitely was the golden era of nose art, simply because of the sheer number of aircraft that were flying uh, for the war effort, you know, uh, over 400,000 aircraft. And the estimates are that the majority of those aircraft had personal markings of some kind, so there was just a lot of artwork out there. Um, you could find characters, you could find names, like uh, George Bush's TBM Avenger had Barbara written on it, uh, or you could find, you know, lovely ladies or these characters. The, the consensus is that most often you'd find a uh, lovely young lady in various stages of undress, and um, 
I want to show you an example here. What I loved about, or loved still about the nose art, is that there was always that uh, a private meaning, or you know, something that the crew could get a chuckle out of if you couldn't find it yourself. And in this particular case, we have this very good, lovely, well-endowed young blonde here, and um, it's she's got her ears plugged. She's sitting on top of that bomb, and she's quite uh, calm and collected. And it says "sure pop," which, from what I understand, means no problem in today's world. But, yeah, sure, sure thing. So she's not worried at all. And next to her, you see a V for victory, a very common symbol for for a uh, positive good luck charm. The V, and then the dot dot and the dash there would be the Morse code for another V. So they're getting their double dose of luck here because they've got their lucky V's in two places there. So it's a great, uh, a great indication of what they used nose art for, which was a good luck charm. Now I'm gonna just give, because there's so much great nose art out there, I'll just do a little um, review of what we have. So we'll see if this works. Okay. Gatefolds, uh, because he realized that it was his gatefolds that were selling all the magazines. And Esquire was starting to supply the military with these um, subscriptions, and they were making a ton of money. And so George Petty began to ask for even more money. Now, in 1939, George Petty could get $1,000 for one gatefold. And that's a ton of money. And he had to do it just one a month. That was the schedule. So um, the editors of Esquire, Paid him the money, but they began to look for another artist because well, they want to find another artist. So they uh, continued on um, with George Petty until they found a young man named Alberto Vargas who was almost starving. He came from Peru, uh, immigrated to Peru when he was like 16 years old, and he was a beautiful artist. His father was a photographer retoucher, and so he was using an airbrush since he was like seven. He was a very, very gifted young man. Anyway, he came over, he worked for Ezekiel Follies for a while, painting the portraits and whatnot, but he was near the end of his rope, but he, he, he was met by the Esquire folks, and they offered to pay him $75 a week. Now, that's kind of pretty good money, but they insisted that they keep all rights to every single design he ever made. Um, and so, in my mind, of course, he was very sorely uh, taken, but at the time, he was very happy to have it, and he took over for George Petty, and they promptly booted George Petty out. Um, anyway, uh, this is a Varga girl. So you'd see a Varga girl as a centerfold in a magazine, and then that magazine would go out to all the theaters, and you would find this very same girl on all kinds of different kinds of airplanes because different soldiers would use that as a reference point. Uh, here's, here's the same gal who went on a 
Now, what, what I see happening a lot on uh, flight jackets, uh, which I think is just fascinating, is how it's used as a group identifier um, and a scorecard for the, for the game to kind of record their, their combat experience. Here's Umbriago. It's a B-24, a crew sitting in front of it there. Now, you guys can tell me, I think there's a couple of A-2s and a couple of B-10s, I think, are there. Is that right? Right, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, these guys are standing in front of their airplane, and they also went and had all of their flight jackets, this particular crew, with the same artwork on the back. So it was sort of their, you know, their school jacket together. They all had the same artwork. It's just beautifully done in this picture. And let's see, let's see. on the back there, you see a, a close-up where they've got the eighth, and they've got the mission markings around the edges. So just, just wonderful work. And that they were all matching, I think, is just very cool. Um, let's see a couple others there. So what you'll see a lot of is you'll see a lot of nose art on aircraft that's then replicated on the crew's jacket. And here's the mislaid. You see the number of missions below him. I also understand that many times they didn't have the missions painted, the number of mission markings painted on, until after they were done, like well after, maybe a month or so after they were actually um, given their end date. So, so they could put the final tally on them. Time is a waste. What I like about this particular jacket, which I think is in one of these books here, you see Time's a Waste and a beautiful Varga pinup girl. And on the top of the, of the bombs, there's 30 bombs there, and in it it spells European Theater of Operations. Now, how he figured out that those 30 letters would fit, but it's just perfect, it works out. So, um, kind of neat little things that they would do with their particular art. Everyone is so personal and has a story behind it, which is what fascinates me about nose art and jackets. Here's Bougarit, um, flown by uh, a, a captain out of uh, Carolina. Um, and he had, uh, on this May 26th year, he had like 67 missions. Um, got all kinds of DFCs, and, uh, just amazing uh, story for this particular gentleman. But I love his artwork on his jacket. Now the materials they used to paint on the on the uh, jackets happened to be whatever was locally around. Uh, if an artist on the field had a, brought his oils with him because he was going to practice doing landscapes during mission, between missions, you know, that guy might be commandeered to do the, the artwork. They might find a guy down the way in a village, and I understand this is particularly true in the uh, southern Mediterranean, Italian, uh, Italy area, the bases there, where they would have really stunning uh, artists locally that would do the artwork for them. And so you can see some really good examples, and you can see some not so good examples. And this particular one is in the uh, um, Air Force Museum up at um, Wright Pat. And what you can see here is that some of these arts went so far, the ones that were um, off base, is they'd paint just generic gals, and then they'd have them on pieces of leather, and then they just store them like a pair of shoes. And then when a, a GI would come in and say, oh, I want something on my jacket, they would just you know, show them these seven gals on, on leather and say, pick one. And the guy could have it sewn on his jacket. So they were sort of pre, you know, preloading the system there. It's kind of neat. So this is an applique example. Now, uh, I'm, again, I'm fascinated by how squadrons come up. So I wish there were more samples. I, mean, I just haven't found a lot, but I'm getting it. There we go. So you can see just the variety and the individuality of each jacket. And, uh, when we talk about jackets as a scorecard, now this individual didn't put a girl on, but what he put it was his mission tallies. And obviously, a very impressive record showing up here. Um, I, it, was, it says up there that this is with the 405th, um, uh, but it was a TBM, or, um, some sort of skip bomber uh, type aircraft. I'm, I'm going to still look into that, but look at that impressive record uh, of tallies on this gentleman's jacket. What's going on? He's a bombardier, I can see that by his badge way up at the top there, so it wasn't the actual pilot of the aircraft. Just fabulous. Now, some jackets didn't use gals so much, uh, but were tributes to another aircraft or another individual uh, for their jacket art. And I thought this was great. This group of uh, B-24 crew decided to name their aircraft after the Red Cross uh, Donut Dollies, they were called. Uh, gal that was uh, near their base, and her name was Bertie Schmidt. 
And so the entire crew painted their jackets for the Schmidt. And uh, next picture here, I'm going to turn around, and there they are, the front side of them. And there's Birdie right there in the middle. And they were just very thankful that these girls gave up their time to serve donuts, to bring them out, cheer them up before and after missions. And they wanted to say thank you to her. Uh, really neat. Um, in 1943, the Army Air Corps decides to um, uh, cease production of the A-2 in leather. The A-2 was originally designed to be in horse hide, and at that time, when it was in 1930, it was designated to be in horse hide because horses were in plentiful supply. The horse and buggy age is on a rapid decline, and the horses were plentiful, you know, uh, and therefore they thought they had lots. But in the middle of the war, we're becoming uh, in a situation where leather is becoming quite scarce, and they began making jackets out of uh, goatskin and cowhide and buffalo and all, anything they get their hands on. And I believe it was uh, Jimmy, either Jimmy Dulater or Hap Arnold that uh, had requested that they change the style of the jacket and not require it to be leather. Uh, his words were, we want these jackets produced in a factory and not in a fashion. And so what they came up with here was this B-10, the next version of the um, military flight jacket. And it's canvas, it's got a fur collar, um, and it looks pretty much like an A-2, except it's, got, it's made out of uh, a different material. And, and flight crews did paint on these, just as they did their A-2s. Now there's even less examples of these painted than you'll find of original A-2s because this cotton material didn't last nearly as long as the leather did. But you can still find some. This is another example out of the Air and Space Museum, uh, excuse me, out of the, <laughs> out of the Air Force Museum at Wright Pat. You could also find other garments that had artwork on them. Uh, this is a, um, a field jacket. You guys correct me, no? keep me honest here. Uh, and another army garment that shows some artwork that what was put on in the field. So after then the B-10, we moved to the B-15, and I don't know exactly when that happened, but it's another evolution of that uh, uh, um, air flight jacket, and it's also um, made not of leather, but of more synthetic materials now, and they're introducing Nomex as a flight retardant. Uh, this happens to be a Korean era, uh, jacket, and you can see there's a painted artwork on the back, but that's very rare, I understand. I've talked to some friends, and maybe I can learn some more stories here today, that uh, in, in the Korean and the Vietnam era, these jackets were rarely worn at all. It was hot for one reason, um, uh, and they had on full gear as well, flight suits and whatnot, and they didn't hardly ever even wear these jackets, um, which makes a lot of sense to me, but they didn't have them. What they did get on occasion, I find, in talking you know, to folks I know were there, uh, is they would have sometimes have these souvenir jackets made. So they had nothing to do with you know, their, their standard military issue, but they would go into a village nearby and they would ask for some embroidery work to be done, perhaps with their military insignia or, or something you know, more personal, you know, that they just wanted on a jacket. And uh, you know, they, they get charged 10 or 12 dollars for you know, something today that might cost you a thousand. I mean, you know, just really, really inexpensive, lovely, lovely embroidery work. And I understand it's done by hand as well. They didn't use machines, which would be more amazing. So the B-15 morphs again uh, to something that's now uh, today and, uh, more like an MA-1, which is today's version of the green olive drab flight jacket, which you can see an example there. Now the picture you see on the right there is Alan Shepard in preparing for a space mission on a geological retrieval training exercise. He has his MA-1 inside out, because you can see one of the survival um, mechanisms of the jacket is it was all orange on the inside. You might have one in here. Um, so that if you were in an emergency situation or whatnot, you could turn the thing inside out and you could be visible from quite a ways away. And he's wearing his inside out. Now, we've been talking about the Army Air Car, the, uh, Air Forces this whole time, but we'll talk, talk a little bit about the Navy. Navy is a much more consistent group, I have to tell you. Um, they stuck with the design of the G1 in the 30s, and essentially it's the same G1 in terms of design as it was 70 years ago. Here's these uh, Corsair pilots in 1942, and those jackets look an awful lot like a, an issued jacket that we have here in the uh, Black Diamonds, flown by uh, an A4 pilot, Terry. Uh, in 1974, right there. I mean, 
very, very similar. They haven't changed much today. Is somebody wearing a current G1 in the room? Because uh, they are actually pretty darn close. So hats off to the Navy. They got right the first time. These jackets are very much collector's items. Um, the painted ones in specific because they are uh, very rare. I am, I am just heartbroken by stories I hear because people bring, have brought uh, original World War II jackets to me and said, I want you to paint this over. You'll have a very faded image, you know, of some pinup. And of course, my first, my first response is, what, are you kidding? <laughs> Absolutely not. They're so much more valuable in their original state. But these, uh, you know, someone will, a grandson will bring one in and say, well, my dad used it to paint the house, or my dad was a plumber, and so he wore it when he was on his plumbing road, you know. These jackets were, you know, just put away as maybe a memory they didn't want to have to think about. They wanted to get back to regular life, these pilots, so they put them in a trunk, and they'd leave them there for 30 years until maybe they passed away. And their son opened the trunk and saw this beautiful jacket that was now all moth -eaten. So we've had several situations where that's happened, um, and I've had, uh, um, the opportunity to send them out to have their cuffs repaired and whatnot so the jacket can at least be on display again. But they are absolutely treasures and I'm hoping if anyone in here has them in the closet that you may be treated as the treasure it is. Um, uh, even in, I think it's on the next slide here, uh, in Japan, I, was, I, read, I referenced this earlier, that the, the Japanese from what I understand, just went gaga in the 80s over vintage aviation flight gear. And the Steve McQueen movies uh, that he was in that included jackets, they, they started an entire company called Buzz Rickman's, which is a Japanese uh, leather gear company. And they named it after the character of Steve McQueen in the movie uh, The Warlocker. That's what the pilot's name was Buzz Erickson. Uh, or Buzz Rickson, excuse me. Um, they have a jacket style that you can buy at Buzz Rickson's today called Virgil. And that was uh, Steve McQueen's name in The Great Escape. So they have a love affair going on with Steve McQueen in his flight jackets. So he was extremely popular in the Japanese in the, in the flight jacket world. I, um, again, what fascinates me most about flight jackets and their artwork is the story behind the jacket. What were you, what, what were you thinking about when you wanted this piece of art in your jacket? And I have just a couple examples here. I could go on for days, but I can already see you're sleeping, so I better get going. Um, this young man was an A4 Apache helicopter pilot uh, today in Montana. He's a reservist, but he should have been born 70 years ago. This guy obviously wanted to be a B-17 pilot in the worst way. Um, so what he did is he bought a B-3 and said, Jerry, make me look like a 1942 B-17. Uh, air crew member, and so we created this uh, Boeing Bell jacket for him. Uh, it's not um, historically accurate. There was a Boeing Bell B-17, but it wasn't part of the 100 bomb room. So, um, and he was just fine with that. He wanted something all his own so that he could be back in 1942 again. Uh, this particular gentleman was promoting a book. He wrote a book called The Last Rock and Roll Show, which was about Buddy Holly and his crash in that little Comanche in a snowstorm in February in 1959, and about this, you know, these music tapes that he had on him when he crashed. Uh, and so he had the car built uh, for the promotion of his book, and then we had the jacket painted. Uh, the, the car cost a lot more than the jacket, just want you to know. And then, uh, I, I enjoy this kid so much, a 16-year-old uh, mother came to us and said, my 16-year-old son wants to remember his grandfather. His grandfather was a P-38 pilot, um, this, uh, Roscoe, excuse me, Harry Hall, and, and he has just lost his grandfather and he wants to remember his grandfather. So we created a, a design that he could always carry around his grandfather with him. And he wore it to school, and he wears it everywhere. Which I'm very proud of. You know, he can talk about his grandfather. People ask him about it. So it's kept his grandfather alive. And this young man, just, uh, he is a hot rodder, obviously. Um, owns Bare Bones Garage, and he built this award-winning hot rod. And I can't tell you exactly what model it is, uh, but just stunning. And he won an award here recently at the LA County uh, Fair, that hot rod show they had in January. Well, a hot rod was actually stolen right off the trailer in the, in the parking lot of the L.A. Fairgrounds. He still has the jacket, though. The jacket wasn't in the car at the time, but he wanted to show the two together. Um, but he has since uh, gotten the car as well. 
Now here's another reservist in Southern California who is recording his uh, flight ratings. You see those small aircraft on the right side of the warbirds? You see the um, Boeing 757. Um, let's see, there's a, uh, a tanker refueler, PC-135 there. Anyway, he said, Jerry, keep room, because as I add more type ratings, I want more airplanes to go on my jacket. So we're, we're keeping this up for me. And this gentleman is on our field at Cable Airport, and he got his pilot's license, or excuse me, he soloed at the very tender age of 76. Uh, and everybody on the field now calls him Pilot Bob, and he's tickled when people call him Pilot Bob. And so he, we, we pitched in and got him a jacket that said Pilot Bob. He just, he just beams, he likes it. Um, I'm not sure how much longer he gets to fly, but he's taking, he's, he's milking it for everything he can get. He's a great guy. So I'm going to go through then the slides, that's just some other ones that we've done. If you have any questions, happy to answer them for you. Um, I apologize that uh, um, you know, if I've gone too fast, I tend to talk too fast all the time, but I'm happy to answer your questions, but we'll see just a couple more examples. Jackets were just coated with a, a coloring on top of them, so the, the jacket was light, like the color of the chairs, and then they would get, put the tan leather on top of it. Nowadays, they put the leather in the big bins and roll it around so that the color goes all the way through, and so uh, you can't get that color off. So what we have to do nowadays, which we don't, didn't have to do on the original ones, is you have to uh, essentially remove uh, as much of that surface as you can to get a good bite. And there's various ways to do that. So very carefully, just where you're going to paint, you can do some removal of the material, and you lay down a base coat, uh, depending on how bright you want it, and then you paint it, and then you seal it, and there you go. Other questions? Well, thank you so much for your time, you guys. I appreciate it. And here's the experts over here. Thank you so much. Wow, wasn't that a wonderful presentation? My goodness, I want more leather jackets. I do. I think they're wonderful. Fabulous. Well, um, as John told you, I'm going to do the ladies part of it. So we're going to talk a little about women's roles in aviation over the years. And we've got some fun uniforms for you to see. And, um, and I am a wasp today. I'm wearing a WASP 1944 WASP uniform. So we're going to start back in um, 1914. So I'm going to have our model come up here. Isn't this a great, a great outfit? Yeah. Well, it's kind of a combination of a uniform and what they needed to wear to stay warm. 
So, um, this is Tori Warner, and today she's Marjorie Stinson. Marjorie Stinson, of course, Stinson Aircraft, she got her, her license, her pilot's license, in 1914. She was one of five women at that time in the United States who had their license. So, of course, we talked about how important leather is to keep you warm while you're flying, keep you safe. They believe that it even would help you if um, your airplane caught on fire. So, um, but she's dressed in some leather. We kind of left her leather coat at home because we didn't want her to smother. She's got an awful lot of clothes on right now. So I'm going to lift up her coat. And she's wearing leather boots. Do you want to walk around a little bit and show them her boots? They go clear up to her knee. And I don't have to tell you, it took us about 15 minutes to get those boots on her. Her mom and I took turns lacing them up. Now, of course, she's got her leather helmet on, and we're cheating because she's got zippers, so this isn't really World War I, but that's okay, you get the idea. Now, the coat actually has army buttons on it, and it's Edwardian. And the reason they call it Edwardian look is because she's got this belt, and it's a little bit high, and if you turn all the way around, the belt's right there, and it's pleated, and this is called duct cotton, so it's very heavy, and so you have to be careful with it because you can get warm pretty fast in it. But there are army, subdued army buttons on it, and the reason we, she's wearing that is because Marjorie Stinson was the first one to get inducted into the Army Air Service Cadet Program back in 1917. Isn't that amazing? Yes, she's the first woman to do that. So we kind of wanted her to have a little bit of a uniform. Now, if we unbutton her just a little bit, she's got her Red Cross sweater on. And this was handmade by a Red Cross chapter here in the United States during 1917. Isn't that something? So it's nice and warm. Now her skirt, is actually made out of the same officer's uniform, army officer's uniform. This is the same material to keep her nice and warm. And if you want to, you can feel the bottom of her skirt. It's very heavy and very warm. And of course, she's got her silk flying scarf. Isn't that great? So she's ready to go flying. Now, they called Marjorie Stinson. I'm not going if you want to. They called Marjorie Stinson the flying school mom because she trained over a thousand Canadi sorry, Canadian air service pilots. So they called her the flying school mom. In 1928, after World War I, she was performing all over the United States. Um, her and her sister Catherine were the first women to fly air mail routes to Canada. So women have been flying for a long, long time. It wasn't just World War II that they got involved with aviation. Now, um, Marjorie Moore won a lot of awards as a stunt pilot. Um, she flew a Jenny Stinson Special, which only had, it was a Jenny with only one seat. She was an amazing woman. Well, thank you so much, Marjorie. Thank you. model are going to go into World War II. Our next model is Betty. And this is women in aviation, so we're not going to talk about pilots just yet, but Betty's wearing a World War II flight nurse class A uniform. And they call this the dark OD, and you see this a lot. And I love this uniform, and one reason I love it is look at the eagle on that hat. And that means so much to women. You know why? They finally made them officers. Army nurses weren't officers to almost the end of World War II. They weren't commissioned. So when we got to wear that eagle, that meant a lot. Well, she's a flight nurse, and this they call this a four-pocket OD tunic. She's got uh, eagle embossed buttons. Her skirt's a six-score skirt. And of course, she's wearing uh, army brown shoes. 
matching gloves. During World War II, all your, uh, your shoes, your gloves, your purse, everything was called tobacco brown, army brown. <laughs> So, um, and Betty's got her purse. That's right, yeah. And she has the rank of second lieutenant on. And of course, her nurse caduceus right here. And then um, her flight nurse. Now, that's how you would distinguish a regular nurse from a flight nurse with her um, flight nurse wings. Now, back in 1942, they decided to train women for air evacuation. And actually, they were doing air evacuation in World War I. They would actually evacuate men on those airplanes. They would put stretchers on the fuselages and hang stretchers on either side. Can you imagine them evacuating something like that? I figure if you survived the airplane ride, you'd survive, period. Don't you think? Yeah. But in 1942, they started training women by the end of the war. They had over 600 women as flight nurses in the Army. Now, um, the Army, for some reason, when they train their flight nurses, they train them very specifically to be able to load the airplanes. They figured, well, if they can tend to the men, they can load the men. So um, that's one reason women actually were wearing flight suits, because a Army nurse told me, a flight nurse, that she couldn't get a parachute over her skirt. So these women actually would um, load the airplanes, take care of the wounded, and handle everything that happened. We lost, uh, I think it was 20 different nurses that went down an aircraft because they didn't, couldn't mark the aircraft with uh, uh, the Red Cross Bazaar on it because the uh, aircraft was often used for supplies, so we weren't allowed to do that. But um, to be a flight nurse, Betty had to carry a 30-pound pack and swim at least a mile with that pack on her back to become a flight nurse in World War II. Go ahead and walk around down here a little bit. Let everybody see. Is it, yeah, the specific, what is it, Fourth Air Force? No, it's a Pacific patch. Right. right, right. Well, by the end of the war, there were still less than 700 flight nurses. Well, it's a beautiful uniform, and Betty's hat is called a baseball. They call, refer to it as a baseball cap because it fit down on the back of her head. And this is the unique thing about World War II is, you know, there's, these uniforms are specific to World War II. They changed so much after the war when we went into Korea. So that's a beautiful uniform. Thank you so much, Betty. Okay. We have our Marine with us. You know what their motto was in World War II? Free a man to fight. So we have a USMC Women's Reserve. There, thank you. Well, um, this is your typical Marine uniform. It's the Alpha uniform. It's their working uniform. And the reason I'm um, showing this uniform off today, and by the way, our model's name is Alexis Warner, and the reason we're showing this off today is because it has aviation patch on it. And that means the woman that wore it, she was an aviation mechanic. She worked on airplanes. And you know what's really neat about that is the waves and the marine women. Now, they didn't have a snappy name for marine women. When they asked the uh, director of the Marine Corps or the general of the Marine Corps, they said, what are you going to name them? They've got waves, wax in World War II, wasps. What are you going to call them? And you know what he said? Nothing. We're not going to call them anything. They're marines. That's the best name in the world. We don't have to call them anything. So she's a Marine Women's Reserve. Well, um, they believed they inducted these ladies for a man to fight. So they became aviation mechanics. They trained pilots in navigation. They were sheet metal workers. It was just amazing. They were anti-aircraft gunners. They taught the men how to use the anti-aircraft guns. 
They did just about everything with these airplanes except fly them. So by the end of the war, waves and marine women, by the end of World War II, 90% of the instructors were women. Isn't that something? By the end of the war. Now, this is a great uniform. She's got her, she's got her marine buttons. She's a sergeant, so you don't mess with her, okay? I always say you don't mess with the NCOs, right? Mm-hmm, no. And she's an aviation mechanic, and of course she's wearing her bell cap. And one thing I want you to notice, her fingernail polish, her lipstick all match the red cord on her bell cap. When they created the uniform, they wanted at least something red on it, because what is the red stripe meat on Marine's pants? It's to remember fallen Marines, right? So they put the cord on her cap. Now this is the first uniform. They had women in World War I, Marine women in World War I, but this is the first uniform they created for Marine women um, for 20 years. So it's a great uniform. You can go ahead and walk around a little bit. And you notice she's got bow pumps. Her, her pumps match her purse. And if you look at her purse, it's kind of got a rough pebbly hide. That's actually buffalo hide. They made those purses out of buffalo hide. We're talking about horse hide and cow hide. They actually made those purses out of buffalo hide. They didn't hold up very well. Well, by the end of World War II, there were 18,000 women Marines that were serving here in the United States and the Pacific. Thank you so much, Alexis. I love this uniform. You know why? Vanessa's wearing it. <laughs> Isn't that great? We give her a hand. We got Vanessa in a uniform. I asked her to volunteer, and she said, sure. And I said, oh, I know which one I'm going to put on. <laughs> I love this uniform. It's so very special because it's a Navy flight nurse, Navy flight nurses. The Army flight nurses were so successful, the Navy said, hey, we got to start training flight nurses, too. The only thing is, during World War II, they did it just a little bit too late. By the end of the war, there were only 125 flight nurses, Navy flight nurses. And actually, we're so lucky because Vanessa is wearing one of them. Her name was Dorothy Freiberg, and she served in the Pacific. And um, she transported, I believe, she transported up to, oh, close to, I think it was, I think by the time they were through, she transported almost 35,000 wounded, uh, her and several other flight nurses. They would land and take off. And of course, all the flight nurses in World War II received the Bronze Stars because they were all in combat areas. Every one of them served in combat areas. Now this is a beautiful uniform, and it's navy. And it's got your... Um, uh, double-breasted, it's your double-breasted navy buttons, and then of course she's got uh, rank around her sleeve, she's a full lieutenant, and then um, she has got uh, her navy nurse insignia, the anchor, uh, acorn, and leaf on her sleeve, and then of course her hat. Now I know you think that's kind of a different looking hat, but that is a beautiful hat. It means a lot. A lot of people call it a brimless hat. They call it a pancake hat. But you know what they called it? Its real name was a halo hat. Now look at it. Put your head up. They called it a halo hat. And you know why they called it a halo hat? That's right. Because the Navy thought their nurses were angels. So they called it a halo hat. And there's one other thing, again, I want to remind you that, hey, we got an officer's eagle on that hat. They finally became officers. Isn't that wonderful? Towards the end of World War II. So it's, again, it's a six-score skirt. It's beautiful. Take a good look at it and take lots of pictures because Vanessa's wearing it. <laughs> and also because they didn't use the double-breasted uniform, again, for women in the Navy. After this one, um, they no longer use this one. That was it. 
This is the last one. All the rest of them are single-breasted for the women. So if you want to walk around a little bit. Alice? If, yes. I might add that that hat she's wearing is very, very rare. Yes. So if you ever come upon one and you're traveling, buy it. Well, the other day there was one on eBay that wasn't in good shape. And I quit looking at the bids, it was 400 and some dollars. Yeah. yeah, all these things are very, very rare and worth a lot of money. And, and they're worth more to me because I, I know their histories and they mean so much. But she does have her balloon flight wings sewn on her jacket, and that's, that's really rare and very special. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, awesome, Vanessa. Uh, and our last model, and then I forgot to tell you about my uniform, but um, this is Vanessa Johnson, and we want to welcome Vanessa. She's the manager at the air park at the Museum of Flight, and she volunteered with us today. Now, for a flight nurse, this is probably the only uniform that makes sense, right? I mean, at, in 47, when we went from Air Force, our Army Air Corps to Air Force, um, they had to figure out something to do for their walks, women's in the Air Force. So finally, they issued them pants. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the first issue of military pants outfit for a woman. So we, we use the Ike jacket here. This, the uniform's dated 1951. So we've got an Ike jacket. We've got the pants. They go down there and, and um, sorry. And let's see, they, they button on that side, right? Yes. So they still wanted to separate them from the men somewhat. So the pants button on the side, of course. And then the Air Force, they stick to blue. And um, the Air Force women, they've never had to tie a tie. So this neat little thing is sewn under her collar. And um, if you ask any of the women who wore this uniform, they hate the blouse. They thought it was really ugly. I thought it was great. I thought, how nice. You don't have to tie a tie. You don't have to do anything. But they didn't care for it. She has the rank of first lieutenant. She has the silver USs, which is very, um, that's Air Force, isn't it, gentlemen? That's Air Force. And then she has her flight nurse wings right there. Um, during Korea, the Air Force flight nurses transported over 250,000 wounded. Air over 250,000 wounded. Quite a bit, isn't it? Really something. Women worked very, very hard. You can go ahead and walk around a little bit. And, oh, yes, one I forgot. I don't know if your flight nurse would actually have a purse with her on the airplane. She may. It was the 50s. But you've got to take a look at this purse as she walks around. It has the Air Force symbol on it. It's made out of cowhide and it's beautiful. You probably won't see that unless you take a picture of that purse. They're very, very rare. Go ahead and walk around. And you notice that her hat, it's very reminiscent of the um, stewardesses of the 1950s. And the lady who actually designed this uniform, she said, I like what the stewardesses are wearing. Let's make our Air Force women look like that. So that's why she's wearing a stitched down flight cap. That's what they call it. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, um, my uniform is a wasp uniform. Oh, I'm sorry. What honey? Oh, I'm sorry. Valerie. I'm so sorry. Let's give Valerie a hand. My uniform was a WASP uniform, Women's Air Force Service Pilots, and it's 1944. And this is the uniform they got when they completed all their training. They learned to fly up to 32, 32 different aircraft. They were very busy, busy ladies. Um, it's called Santiago Blue because it's very, very bright blue. Uh, uh, Jackie Cochran wanted a uniform that reflected the blue of the skies and um, everything wonderful about what her ladies were doing and learning and teaching. And so uh, she picked this uniform. Now, the generals, the generals uh, over Jackie didn't want her to have any new uniforms. 
they wanted her to use old army nurse uniforms, and Jackie said, no, I want to create something very special. So she went to I and Megan, and they created this. Well, she said, I want this, and they said, well, we don't really have enough money. We have some old army nurse uniforms. I think they'll work for your women, your wasps. And Jackie said, well, I don't think so. I want to show you mine. And so the general said, here, I'll give you two uniforms, and you show us theirs. So there'll be three uniforms we'll all pick from, right? Well, Jackie wasn't stupid. She was a woman. So she put the uniforms that the generals picked on, two very skinny, unattractive models, and she put her uniform, the wasp uniform that she loved, on a very sexy, beautiful model. Well, guess which uniform the men picked? Yeah, made sense, didn't it? They picked this uniform, so that's what they got. When they were able to complete all of their training, when they graduated, this is the uniform, the Santiago Blue. I've got fairing command uh, devices on my shoulder. I have the Army Air Corps patch on my sleeve. I have flat black buttons because I'm not really part of the Air Army Air Corps. I'm kind of a part, I'm under the Civil Air Patrol, but I'm not really part of the military. Even though 100 or um, 1,000 women got their flight wings, 38 women died because they carried aircraft that didn't work properly because of accidents, because they towed targets so the men could shoot at them, learn to shoot with live ammunition. 38 of these women died, but they weren't allowed to wear military buttons on their uniforms, and I have no rank. But they were amazing women, and they just wanted to fly, so they, they got to fly. Unfortunately, the program didn't last for more than a year and a half, so women didn't fly again until 1976, which is very sad. But well, I want to thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed our little fashion show. And thank you for inviting me back. Good afternoon, folks. Um, our, our presentation, I'm Captain Christopher Miller of the Historical Aviation Guild. We are a group of historians, collectors, that are extremely passionate about the aviation history of World War II. Amongst our members, we probably have over two, 200 years of collecting knowledge to, to back up. And we're going to give you an idea. Jerry did an awesome, awesome job at giving you a history of the flight jacket. But I kind of want to touch on some, some flight jackets that most people aren't aware that were worn during World War II. Um, first off, I'm going to show you, I actually am wearing an original A2 jacket from World War II. Um, this outfit would, would have been very common to a B-25 crewman, um, hence I'm John, I'm honoring you. <laughs> but uh, very, uh, what you would see here is a officer service shirt, pants, AN-65 flight suit, and an A2 jacket, and a parachute harness, and May West. Um, very basic uniform because B-25, A-26s, medium range bombers. They were tactical bombers. They were flying behind the lines in uh, very short interdiction missions. They weren't flying the high altitude of the B-17s and the B-24s. They didn't need the shearling clothing. It's that they were a little bit lighter. Um, I'll touch on the, uh, the parachute harness just a little bit. This is an A a three parachute harness. Um, it never actually did have the parachute attached while you had it on. The parachute was a separate pack because you needed to move around the aircraft. And you couldn't move around very well. And if you look at Grumpy, especially the tunnel to get into the volunteers position is very cramped. If they needed to bail out, they had their parachute pack. And what, it, what this was, it was, it was a quick attachable. We attached it like this, went up to the, uh, the hopefully a open hatch, pulled the, jumped out of the plane and pulled the land there, and hopefully whoever packed the parachute <laughs> did a good job and it opened for you. So this is um, basically what you would have seen a uh, Army Air Crew crewman for Grumpy would have been worn during war. 
Hey, your cuffs are a little reddish. Are they original or did you get a replaced? Unfortunately, no. These are replacement uh, cuffs, but I did do the cherry red cuffs. Um, the cherry red cuffs are a favorite amongst collectors. Don't ask me why during the war it didn't make any difference to the guys. In fact, really, when it comes down to it, it's collectors, historians, we get passionate about the history. For the most part, this stuff is just clothes. They wanted to fly their 25 missions and get home. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, we'll move, move on. Actually, if you can see around the corner over here, the first mannequin, this is a uh, B-3 flight jacket. This is a heavier flight jacket. This would have been for your B-17, B-24 crewmen, uh, especially your air gunners, because your air gunners were standing at an open window. It was 30 degrees below zero. This shearling clothing was the only thing to keep you in from frostbite. Um, Rob, if you want to come up to, um, I'm going to call Captain Boffman up here. The, the B-3 actually had matching cheerleading pants um, that, they, that they wore. Later in the war, like Jerry said, she touched on the production models, they wanted to get away from leather. Uh, the shearling gear in particular was horribly, horribly tough to keep, uh, keep repaired. And so they went to the cotton, um, uniforms. Um, in fact, the Aero Test Laboratory out of Dayton, Ohio, constantly was during the war. Most of the stuff that you see RAI uh, touting today about layering and the fleece jackets and everything, that wasn't RAI's idea. That came out of the Aero Test Laboratories during World War II. The layering concept was something that they, the Army pioneered. Um, with Captain Bachman here, you're going to see the B-3 and actually, I'll turn, I'll turn it over to him. <laughs> I guess I'll take over the fact that I kind of put this together just to actually kind of show people you don't get to see a lot of this particular gear. And when we're invited to come in and do you know, the flight jackets, most of the time you think of flight jackets of World War II, you think of the A2 and the B3. This is actually a B6. Mm -hmm. You don't see too many of these, but for the fact that really only the difference between the B6 and the B3 is the amount of piling and the shirt. The B3 has about a one inch piling, which made it pretty darn bulky. This only has a three quarter inch. Uh, you didn't see too many guys actually fly with these, just for the fact that, believe it or not, a quarter inch piling makes a big difference in regards to how warm you stay. Some of the guys said this didn't keep them warm enough. As a result, you see a lot of guys on the ground crew. This became the favorite jacket of the ground crew mechanics. And you, just about every picture you see in England during the winter months, this is what they're wearing. Um, Chris kind of uh, talked a little bit about Eddie Bauer and REI and everything. It was Eddie Bauer that actually manufactured these pants right here and actually it was where he got his start, right here in Seattle. He got his first army on contract making these pants right here. These are an A8 flight pants. These were the first pants that the Army Air Force went on to continue flight pants after giving up on making the big bulky leather showing pants. Let me tell you, these turkeys will keep you warm. They're really thick. They're a pillowed inside and filled with goose down. And about the only thing I don't have on right now is a, the electric underwear suit. And you can wear those actually under this. Um, I think as the war progressed, a lot of the flyers complained a lot about the fact that it's bulky. And as you see, progression throughout the war. Come up to Civil Air Patrol members and go, oh, you're in the Army Air Corps. And you're like, no, I've got red epaulets. I'm just in Civil Air Patrol. But the uniforms are essentially the same, except for the different kinds of insignia. Like in my service cap, it's the same as Army Air Corps, but I've got the little Civil Air Patrol insignia in it. I've got a Civil Air Patrol patch on the left here with the little U.S. And then a little interesting note is my wings. So the original Civil Air Patrol wings that were issued to those pilots look very different from this. They looked very similar to the German Luftwaffe insignia, but it had the little triangle in the blue. Well, a lot of the CAP pilots didn't like this. So they would get their own uh, wings, like Army Air Corps Observer wings, and then they'd take a button and would affix it to the middle. This was known as trick insignia. It was completely unauthorized, but they did it anyways. A lot of times in the Civil Air Patrol, a lot of things were unauthorized, 
but they could get away with it because we weren't officially part of the military. We're still technically civilians. But we performed a lot of the missions that relieved pilots and air crew members to go over in the theater. Kind of similar with, with the Marines, with what they were doing. So Civil Air Patrol had some big missions during World War II. We did liaison patrol down along the border because it was a lot of people worried about the Germans invading from Mexico. So Civil Air Patrol pilots in their own airplanes would volunteer and perform missions along the southern border. We also performed courier service for all the branches of the military, transferring documents that needed to get someplace in a hurry. All right. We also had uh, the most famous mission that Civil Air Patrol had was coastal patrol on the east coast, where we were basically out there patrolling in our own small little airplanes, like the Beechcraft Staggerwing over there, or something small like the L-4 here, or maybe like a little Stinson. There would be two, a pilot and an observer in that small little airplane. It was their airplane that they owned, and they'd have like maybe a 250-pound bomb strapped to the bottom or a depth charge, and they were basically out there patrolling for Germany's U-boats. After the war, when they interviewed, excuse me, interviewed Carl Dunis, who was in charge of all the U-boats during World War II, they asked him. They said, "How come there were no attacks on the East Coast of U-boats?" And his, he replied with, it was those damn little yellow and red airplanes. He was talking about the air crew members of Civil Air Patrol. So they would go out there and patrol day and night, 24 hours, their airplanes on their dime, risking their lives. And Civil Air Patrol is actually credited with two confirmed U-boat kills from their little aircraft. And uh, I can't remember the specifics, but I believe it was about 50 Civil Air Patrol airmen lost their lives out there doing missions. That was my question, if you lost them. Okay. Yes, they did. Uh, in addition to the Coastal Patrol, Civil Air Patrol actually did a lot of search and rescue for the Navy and the Army Air Corps doing missions off the East Coast and the West Coast. So Civil Air Patrol, not so known, but I think we did play a really important part in, uh, in World War II history. A lot of stuff we're protecting the home front. Well, thank you. By the way, the correct radio call when you drop a 250-pound bomb from an L-4 and explode a U-boat is yee-haw. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Stay as long as you want. Uh, we'll get the music going. The coffee uh, is hot. That's the best thing you can say about it. And uh, look forward to seeing you on Aviation Day, May 18th. Thank you. Thank you.